Alright, go ahead and go to Jeremiah tonight. Jeremiah chapter 3 and then uh, turn over to Hosea chapter 11 and maybe save your spot there. I'm just going to read one verse from Hosea, but I want to read Jeremiah chapter 3 first to start the message off. We're going to start reading in verse 6. It says, The Lord said unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom, that, the defi- uh, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. And I will not keep anger forever, only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Did anybody notice a word that was used in there quite a bit? What was that word? Backsliding. All right. You're all familiar with the term backsliding, I think. And if you look at uh, Hosea chapter 11, verse 7, referring to Israel, it says, And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. And that's where I want to get the title of the message tonight Bent to Backsliding. We see. Throughout the Old Testament, when you read it, it's almost annoying and frustrating when you read about Israel getting right with God and then backsliding. And then getting right with God and then backsliding. When they would backslide, they would get in big trouble. And then they'd call out to the Lord. He'd be merciful. He'd send a deliverer, somebody like Samson or Gideon along. And then things would go good for a while. And then they would backslide again. And they constantly did it. And here in Hosea, he's saying they are bent on backsliding. Okay? I mean, it's just, it was a natural thing for them to backslide. And you know what? We are no different either, are we? Okay? Backsliding is one of the most natural things that we do. And backsliding, we should always be on the lookout for this. We should always be watching out for it. You really, we, can, we backslide with zero effort. It takes no effort for you to backslide. We are, because of our sinful flesh, we are kind of bent on backsliding. Have you ever shot a bent arrow before? Okay. When I was a kid, I had a bow and arrow and I only had like two arrows. I was always breaking all of them. And I had like two arrows and one of those arrows was bent and it flew crooked. And I shot that arrow so many times I got good at hitting targets with that bent arrow. I knew how it flew that much, but it, it didn't fly right because it was bent. And we do not naturally do the right thing, do we? We have to make a conscious effort Every single day, if we're going to move forward, if we're going to do right, we all know that, don't we? I don't think there's anybody in the world that would deny that we are bent on backsliding. Nobody in the world would deny that you know, it is, it's completely natural. Nobody would deny if, and say that I, they've never been backslidden before. You know, we would all agree with this 100%. It's, just, it's a simple law. It's as simple as what goes up must come down. That's just kind of, it's kind of how we are. It's natural, no effort. And we do, we have to make a conscious effort. And we all know Proverbs 24, verse 16. It says, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Even a just man, he's going to fall. He's going to mess up. Do we not agree with that? Does anybody in here think they're perfect? Does anybody think anybody else is supposed to be perfect? Okay, do we not all agree? All right, you know, shake your head if you agree with me. I mean, do I all agree that we are bent on backsliding? Okay, I don't want to have to spend a whole lot of time on this. All right, but at the same, I, I think we all understand that. And while we would all agree 
that we are bent on that and it is a completely natural thing that if we're not careful, it will happen to us. Nobody wants to ever admit they are backslidden. Think about that for a second. We all know how normal that is, but yet when somebody gets called out for being backslidden, oh no, not me. Because many times we, do, we forget that backsliding, it, it doesn't take effort. It's not the same as rebellion. Some people, when, you know, they rebel. They know they're doing wrong. They make a conscious choice to do the wrong thing. But a person who's backslidden, it just kind of happens. And if, if you do not make an effort, if you are not constantly trying to go forward, you will backslide. And we need to understand that and just get that in our head. And so some things to realize about backsliding real quick is one, it doesn't happen overnight. Okay? You don't just decide when you, you think about, all right, it's, it's too hard to recognize our own sin. All right. So you, let's think about other people's sin for a minute. Cause that's easy. All right. You know, you think about that Christian that, you know, this is really backslidden. I mean, they are so far away from God right now. It's not even funny. Now, if you went and you talked to that person if you could at least get them to acknowledge the state they're in. Maybe they used to be in church. They used to be on fire for God. Now they don't even go to church. Now that instead of being in church tonight, they're sitting at home and they're drinking a beer. They're backslidden as all get out. And you know, if you went and talked to that person, they weren't sitting in church one day and then just decided, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to go home and I'm not going to go to church anymore and I'm going to start drinking beer on Sunday nights. Nobody decides. You know, they don't, backslidden people don't decide to do that. Now a rebel might. A rebel will. I've seen the rebels. I've seen the young people. As soon as they're old enough to get out of the house, they leave the house and they go and they jump right into all that stuff. They are in rebellion, but a person who is backslidden, they get there slowly. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not the same as rebellion. A long and a long, slow process of backsliding, it can happen without you even knowing you're doing anything wrong. And, not, and, Here's the other thing we need to understand too about backsliding is not everyone's backsliding is going to look the same. Okay. We all have an image of our head, you know, maybe for ourselves. You know, if, if I got backslidden enough, I can imagine myself doing this or that, but it's going to be different for other people. Proverbs 14 verse 14 says the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. A good man shall be satisfied from himself. Okay. That backslider in heart. He's going to get caught up in his own ways and what he likes. Uh, and I think it was in James, I preached about a while back, uh, where it talks about every man is drawn away. Uh, he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I, I butchered that uh, passage. But basically, we all have different things that tempt us, don't we? And every one of us in here, if today we were to start on a process of backsliding that lasted for a year, five years, ten years, whatever... We are all going to kind of end up in a different place, aren't we? We're not all going to be doing the same thing. Some of you might be drunk. Some of you might be drug addicts. Some of you might be uh, gamblers. Some of you, I, you know, who knows? Some of you might be Catholic. You know, I, I don't know. You know, it, it, it's going to look different. It's going to look different for everybody because we all have our own areas where we get tempted. And so when it comes to, to backslide, okay, it's natural. If you... All you have to do is just take a break from moving forward and you will begin to backslide. That's, that's, a, that's just a fact. The way, I, the way I like to illustrate it, you know, the Christian life, it's kind of like walking uphill on an icy street. Okay, Have you ever tried going uphill when it's covered in ice and you're, you're making forward motions, but you're kind of going backwards? And it, does, it takes a lot of effort to continue going forward because you've got things working against you, pulling you back at the same time. And if you're on an icy uphill street, if you just do nothing, you're going backwards, aren't you? And that's what happens to a Christian. If you just do nothing, you're not just going to stay in the same place. You might be satisfied with where you're at right now. You might think you're a good Christian, but if you get satisfied, if you stop right here, you will begin without even trying the process of backsliding. It's, a, it's completely natural. And how does God deal with backsliding? Well, first, God wants to correct us gently with a still, small voice. That, that's what God wants to do. You know, God wants to just, you know, God wants us while we're reading our Bible 
to see something in the Scriptures that jumps out and says, hey, wait a minute, you're off right now. You're, you're getting away from me. You're backsliding on me. He wants to do it in a gentle way. He wants to just have the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. But does that always work? The still small voice doesn't always work. And so when the still small voice doesn't work, usually what God ends up doing is he ends up sending a loud mouth, loud mouth prophet your way. You know, he gets the preacher up there and he just starts hammering one of your sins. Hey, it's time to wake up. What's wrong with you people? You know what? You know, y'all aren't right with God. You're away from God. You know, what's wrong with you? You're in sin right now. And then you, you hear that and you're like, I'm uncomfortable. This doesn't, I, I didn't think I was doing anything bad. I will, you know, they, you hear these preachers get up and they make you sound like you're just evil and horrible. And what's wrong with this guy? I'm not trying to be evil. I'm not trying to be wicked. I'm a good person. But maybe you're just backslidden and you don't realize it because it was such a slow process. You didn't realize how bad it got. And God's going to do that. He's going to want to send prophets your way. They're going to, they're going to shake you up. They're going to maybe scream at you a little bit. And you know, we often find this loudmouth prophet obnoxious, but in you know, a lot of times we think he's making way too big a deal about nothing. But remember, when you are backslidden, you're often in a very dark, dirty place that you slowly got conditioned to. There are some places that you and I, we could not walk into today and be comfortable. But after a long, slow process of backsliding, we can get conditioned to new surroundings and things won't bother us anymore. And, but then when there's a person who is right with God, when there's a person who is spirit filled, it, they're still going to see that sin like God sees it. You might not think it's a big deal, but they, they do. And they're going to scream about it. They're going to make a huge deal about it. And if that doesn't work, if the loudmouth prophet doesn't work, then chastisement's next. God's going to have to chastise us. God's going to send trouble our way to try to shake us up and to wake us up. And then if that doesn't work, I think the final stage is God will just kind of put you up on a shelf and be done with you. And what we're talking about tonight, I believe it applies to us as individuals, as families, as a church, if we're not careful as a church, we will stop moving forward, which will begin a backsliding process. And we could find ourselves, listen, these churches that are doing the rock and roll and all the stuff that they're doing, it didn't happen overnight. It was a slow, long, slow process of backsliding. And not only does this apply to individual churches, I think you can apply it to you know, uh, religions as a whole. I think you could apply what I'm talking about tonight to, you know, independent fundamental Baptists as a whole. I believe we have gotten very backslidden as, as a whole. And um, every bit of what I want to talk about, I think it applies to every, every group. And so what do we do when we realize we're backslidden? Because this is where, this is where the problem is. And this is what I want to focus on tonight because I think we've all, I think we all agree. Y'all look like you agree with me that backsliding is something that it happens with zero effort. It's something that can happen to anybody. It's something that will happen to any of us. If we just zero effort will result in us backsliding. And when you're, when you're backsliding, you don't realize it. It's slow. You get conditioned to things. And what do we do when, when that person, that other person, okay, once again, let's look at the other person sins. Cause that's easy. When we see that person that's all backslidden, you know, what, what is it we want? Well, we want them to repent. We want them to, hey, admit you're backslidden. Change your ways. That's what we want them to do. That's, that's our desire. We want to see them change. And so when, what, what do we do when we realize we're backslidden? What, whenever you guys hear that, ser you know, that sermon from me, where I just pounce on your sin and you don't like it, you know, whether it's somebody else preaching, you know, what should we do as a church? Hey, there's been things that we've done as a church before. There's been things that I've taught before that just never really thought of. And I heard some other loudmouth preacher get up, you know, these churches that are doing this and this. And I'm like, we do that. What? Wait, wait a minute. You know, we're not bad. You know, we're, we're not, we're not one of those bad churches, are we? You know, it doesn't feel good. When all of a sudden you realize, hey, I'm backslidden. Okay, I, I, you know, but we need, to, we need to realize that just because some guy, and I, I don't want to make an excuse for backsliding, okay? 
Um, there, there is, you know, we should not backslide. If you are in a backslidden state, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to make you feel good about it, but I am trying to say that none of us should be surprised when we find out we're backslidden in some area. It should not be a surprise. As an individual, you shouldn't be surprised if one of these days I'm like, hey, what's wrong with you? You know, shape up. You know, we should, as a church, if one of these days, you know, we get, you know, I get confronted by another preacher. Hey, why are you guys doing that in your church? What's wrong with you people? We shouldn't be shocked when that happens because we are bent on backsliding. And we're seeing this right now. You know, Independent Fundamental Baptists, they, I mean, we're, it's not doing too good. And you got people out there screaming at him. You got obnoxious prophets saying, hey, what's wrong with you people? And, you know, and, no, we, we can't be bad, can we? Well, why, why are we so surprised? Are we not bent on backsliding? Are we that much different than Israel was? Are we that much different than everybody else? Well, listen, when that happens, when we, come, when we come to that place, when we are confronted, whatever it is, when we are confronted with wrongdoing, First thing we need to do, and it's real, it's, it's simple to say, but it's hard to do, and that's just admit it. Just admit that you are wrong. Admit that you are backslidden. Look what it says in Jeremiah 11, or 3, verse 11. It says, And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go on and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not... Cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed the voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of the city of the city and of the family, and I will bring you to Zion. We see here he God's told, Hey, admit it that you've done wrong. Admit it. Acknowledge your iniquity. You know, you've justified yourself. And that's what people do all the time. When you confront them, when, you, when the preacher gets up and preaches, hey, you've done wrong. And what do they want? Well, you know, I got a reason for that. You know, there's a reason. I, you know, we won't say we're backsliding, but, you know, I've got an excuse for this. You know, there's a reason I'm doing that. Hey, you know, what's going you know, A lot of times we backslide maybe in our music. We start listening to stuff that we probably shouldn't be listening to. You know, we start watching stuff that we shouldn't be watching. And then every once in a while, a preacher gets up and maybe he gets on your movie that you like or your TV show. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not wicked for watching that. Well, maybe you're just backslidden. You know, you've gotten conditioned to that stuff. It doesn't bother you anymore. Listen, if he's, if he's preaching about it, if the Holy Spirit's convicting you, just admit it. Just Man, I, I did it again. Listen, we don't notice it. This isn't like rebellion. Okay, it's not like rebellion where we know what we're doing. It's backsliding. We don't realize it. Okay, you know, rebellion. You could say it's kind of like you know you're going one direction, like you know I don't want to go that way anymore, and you start going the other direction towards sin. But backsliding, you're still looking that way, but you're kind of going backwards, aren't you? You're going, you're you're going the wrong direction. You're getting close to that sin, but you're not looking at it necessarily. And so you think you're okay, but guess what? If you get back here, you're still in it. And somebody comes along and they confront you with it, and oh, yep, sure enough, I'm there. You know what? Don't justify it. Just admit it. And I, I tell you, I wish I wish people would do that. I wish church members would do that. I wish preachers would do that. You know, when you've got preachers that are preaching some of the foolishness they're preaching. Hey, what's going on here? And somebody, you know, somebody calls them out on it. Hey, that, that's not in the Bible. Oh, yeah, but wait, I've been saying that for years. I'm just doing a talk. Don't justify it. It's not in the Bible. Why can't you ever get up and say you're wrong? Why can't you ever get up and say, you know what? I didn't teach that exactly right. You know, nobody thinks you're perfect. Nobody thinks that you've never made a mistake before. Just admit it. But no, we want to justify it. Oh, no, it's got to be the right thing. All the great men of the past preach it too. I, I, I know. No, just don't justify it. Don't justify the fact that you're preaching false doctrine, that it's against what the Word of God says. Hey, just admit that you got backslidden. The Bible talks about false doctrine. It comes in privily. They privily they bring in damnable heresies. It doesn't just come in overnight. It's a slow process. And you would think preachers out of anybody would realize how bent on backsliding we are. And when they find themselves in a backslidden state, you'd think they'd be the first ones to be able to say, I admit it. But they're sometimes the last ones to say, I admit it. 
Listen, no matter how bad it is, we've seen and we've talked about some of the craziness that's going on in fundamentalism today. And you know, and you do, you got you got your loudmouth prophets out there. You know, you got your Stephen Andersons that are out there that what do they do? You know, they'll see these things and they'll go and they'll make a whole documentary exposing it. And you know what? That's kind of annoying. You know, it kind of stinks when you got some guy out there that goes and he's exposing one of your heroes. And it's like, yeah, that's true. That he's wrong. Oh, but, but I like that guy, you know, no, he, he, he's one of my heroes, you know, but, but, you know, and he's over there. No, man, he's preaching a lie. This is a lie. This is against the Bible. Shut up. I don't want to hear about it. I like that guy. You know, what do we do? We just, Hey, you know, he, he's a good man. You know, all that he's done, you know, all that he's accomplished, but no, listen, he, don't justify it. Admit it. They're backslidden. And I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it when I find out that, you know, there's you know, when somebody teaches me and they show me that something I've been doing is wrong. I don't like it. Oh, I mean, I, I've always done it that way. I, oh, but yeah, you know, the Bible does say that. It doesn't feel good. But you know what you have to do? You have to admit it. Yeah, I, I, I'm wrong. And it's not going to feel good when your preacher gets up and he tells you, hey, you're backslidden, you're wrong, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be dressing that way. You shouldn't be talking that way. You shouldn't be watching that. You shouldn't be going there. What's wrong with you? Oh, I'm not a bad Christian. I'm a good Christian. I'm not, I'm not, you know, maybe you're just backslidden. Maybe it, he said it happens without you even thinking about it. Just admit it. He said, acknowledge you know, acknowledge what you've done. Admit what you've done. That's what God wants us to do. If we're going to be saved, don't we have to admit we're sinners? And if we're going to get cured from our backsliding, we've got to admit, Lord, I've gotten away from you. Lord, I, I've, I've backslidden. Lord, I have sinned and we've got to name the sin. And I wish, I wish we'd get God's people to do that. I wish preachers would do that. You know, just, just admit it. Yeah, I got caught up. I got caught up in the frenzy. I got caught up in the hype. You know, I trusted somebody that I shouldn't have trusted. You know, these people that are preaching the crazy things, many of them, they're just, they're repeating what they've heard. They didn't really study it out. And it's not that they're horrible people. They're just backslidden. And people don't like hearing that. People don't like being reminded, they don't like being reminded of it. But listen, when it happens, you need to acknowledge it. First John 1 John 1.9, written to save people. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you are backslidden, if I preach on one of your sins, you know what? Just confess it to God. Say, Lord, I, yeah, I did that. The preacher, He got on my sin tonight. I've done that. Lord, forgive me. If, I, if I'm preaching something wrong and I get confronted with it, that's not time for me to you know, get all full of pride and get stubborn and stiff necked. That's time for me to just say, I did it again. And maybe I'll start being more careful. Maybe I start studying a little more instead of just repeating what I've heard. And I've done that before. I've, I've done that before where I've, I've preached stuff. And then later I'm reading my Bible and I'm like, oh, that doesn't line up with what I said at all. And then I'm like, why did I even say that? And I'll think about it. Yeah, I heard this preacher say it one time. And, and you feel stupid. And that doesn't feel good. And we just when you do that, you know what you do? You admit it. Yeah, I, 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 got, I got it wrong. But you know what? Pride. Okay, there's two sins that just kill us when we're backslidden. And pr pride is one of them. Pride will not let us admit we're wrong. And listen, admitting you're wrong is the first step but do you realize c completing the first step doesn't get you anywhere? If you're backslidden and you take the first step, you admit that you're backslidden, well, you haven't gotten anywhere, have you? We see that all the time. We're out door knocking. We pretty much talked to a guy yesterday, said he's saved, you know, and he's, you know, knows he's not doing anything he's supposed to do. And he really had no intention of doing anything he was supposed to do. And you know, all right, well, great. You know, you're admitting you're backslidden. You're admitting you're not living for God. But he had no intention of moving forward. And so, you know, you admit, just admitting that you're backslidden, that's good, okay? You're doing better than a lot of people, but understand you haven't gotten anywhere yet when you admit it. And here's, and here the other, this is where the other sin comes in. So pride's the first one that won't let us admit 
that we're, we're wrong, that we're backslidden. But then the second sin is stubbornness and stubbornness won't allow us to change. And that, that happens all the time in, in individuals, you know, the preacher will prove something for the scriptures. Yeah, we're wrong. All right, fine. I'm wrong. Okay. So now are you going to change? Uh, I, I can't change. You know, I don't want to rock the boat in my family. If I change in this area, it's going to make my wife mad. It's going to upset my kids. Uh, I can't do that. You know, with preachers, if they get confronted with false doctrine, you know, pride is not going to let them admit they're wrong. But if you can at least give them to admit they're wrong, what do they end up doing? Well, so now what are you going to do about it? Nothing. Well, I don't want to upset the other preacher friends. I don't want to hurt myself politically. You know, I just, I'd rather do nothing. Okay, well, great. So you accomplished the first step of what you need to do when you're backslidden. You've admitted that you're wrong, but that gets you nowhere until you change your ways. Until you start doing the right thing and stubbornness, pride and stubbornness are killing individuals. It's killing churches. It's killing preachers. And you better get over those sins. Just, just admit it, folks. Uh, you know, if I change, I just know I'm going to go right back to doing it again and I'm going to look like an idiot, always going back and forth. So, you just rather stay back there all the time? Why don't you just move forward and keep going forward? You know, just, just keep, don't, don't give up. That's not going to accomplish anything. So, uh, Proverbs 28, verse 13. So, you got, the first thing you have to do, you just have to admit it. I'm wrong. I preached this wrong. I taught it wrong. You know, I said the wrong thing. I'm willing, I'm willing to change it. And then, you know, after you admit it, then you've got to actually implement change. You've got to do things different. Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confessing, all right? You're admitting it, but you have to confess and forsake. Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. There's that stubbornness again. Just, I'm not going to change. I'll, I'll admit I'm not perfect. Yeah, because none of us are perfect. But I'm not changing anything. I'm not changing anything in my life. I'm not going to go have a house cleaning. I'm not going to go clean the junk that's, that's in my house out that shouldn't be in there. I'm not changing anything in my life. We're not going to change any of our doctrine here at this church. You know, we're not, we're not going to change a thing. We're going to keep, you know, uh, fine, yeah, fine. I'll admit I'm not necessarily right, but I'm not changing anything. Well, you've not accomplished anything. And one of the problems in fundamentalism today is we focus so much on not changing, we're unable to realize we're backslidden on anything. Because see, that's been, that's been kind of the thing that's been being pushed for a long time. Don't change, don't change. Don't change. Stick by the stuff. Stick by the stuff. Stick by the stuff. Well, here's the problem with that. If you're not moving forward, you're sliding backwards. And we've gotten into this position where, no, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move. And they, it's like, I'm not going to change. And they don't even realize it's like they're standing still on that slippery uphill street and they think they're not moving, but they're sliding backwards and they don't even realize it. It's slow. But they're sliding backwards. And a lot of these churches that are the biggest into the don't change are changing. They don't realize it, but they are. They're, I mean, some of the crazy things that are being taught in these churches, some of the crazy practices. Okay, I, I talked about a lot of this last week with all this community involvement junk. I'm sick of these churches getting up and having lost people come in and giving them awards and plaques and all these things when i the first time i ever saw that i didn't know baptist churches did that the first time i ever saw that i got one of these magazines from paul chapel's church out in california and they had this magazine uh, in this magazine it showed them giving these plaques or something to it was some city council group or something in california because they had taken a stand and they were trying to stop them from saying prayer in their city council meetings and so, and these people, they took a stand and they were going to pray any, they were going to pray anyway. And so they brought these people in and they gave them a defender of the faith award. Okay. Now that sounds pretty innocent, but I'm like, no, wait a minute. That's not a defender of the faith award because they had people from all different religions coming in and praying for them. I don't think a whole lot of the praying going on was necessarily in Jesus name. So how was that a defender of the faith award? 
You could say maybe it was a defender of religious freedom reward or you know award, but they're not defenders of the faith. I'm like, what in the world? You know, that's these you know, and that's uh, and these city council meetings where they do that. They do. They're always inviting different people from all the denominations because they have got to have diversity. If they're going to have a Christian, they're going to have to have a Catholic and a Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness and a Wiccan and all these different people. How is that defending the faith? And we're going to just. And I understand that's a city council group. That's something completely separate. Why in the world would you bring them in and give them a Defender of the Faith Award? If these people are from some of these other religions, you know they're not saved. Now, how do you, go, how do you tell somebody they need to get saved when they've got a Defender of the Faith plaque hanging on their wall? Good luck with that. And we and the churches are doing that all the time. You know, they're all, they're, we've got to find some way to get the community in here. Yeah, praise some politician... And he's going to come in there. You know, a politician, they're going to, they're going to come into a church if, if you're going to honor them. You know, that's, all those people are probably going to vote for me if I do that. And it's like, I can't believe that's going on in churches. That honestly sickens me and disgusts me. I don't think that would have happened 10 or 20 years ago. But it's happening in mainstream IFB hashtag old paths churches. And how did that happen? These people are don't change, don't because they're don't change, don't change, and they don't realize they're going backwards. And you hear the you know the dispensationalism stuff that's coming into these churches. I don't ever remember hearing anybody teach that craziness growing up. And yet now it's being shoved down our throats in a lot of these circles because they can't admit that they've been wrong on end times and Zionism, which is another new thing. They can't admit they've backslidden on that. And so, you know, it's like, you know, it's don't change, don't change, don't. And it's like, man, listen, the Bible should change us. We should constantly be changed by this Bible. We should constantly be getting better. I've talked to preachers and I've showed them things from the scriptures. Like, look, this is what the Bible says. And they never respond with a, no, you're interpreting that wrong. This is what the Bible teaches. You know what I hear all the time? You're never going to change us. And they say it like it's so bold. And I, we're going to stick by the stuff and we're going to defend the faith. We're never going to change. Yeah, you are. You're sliding backwards. And that's why we're getting into all the craziness we're getting into in independent fundamental Baptist churches because they're, they're so focused on not changing and it's like the new, you know, uh, you know, the new character trait that's the key in IFB is stubbornness. And the Bible says stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And you, you can't change these people for nothing and they need to be changed because they're backslidden. But you can't get anybody to admit it. Pride sets in. And even if you show them, hey, this is what the Bible says. Oh, well, stubbornness. Not going to change. Not going to change. I listened to 14 messages at the Old Paths conference saying, don't change. Don't change. And, you know, and they got that ringing in their head. I'm not changing. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to let that Bible change me. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let it fix my doctrine. I'm not going to let it change my life. That's what we need. Because we are constantly backsliding and we're going to find ourselves all the time in positions where we're like, we need to change again, folks. Hey, we slipped in this area. Let's get right. Let's change this. Let's move forward. But people, they, they don't want to do that. And so in the Christian life, it is. It's like walking that uphill street covered in ice. If you're just standing still, you're sliding backwards. But when a person openly changes, it gives a testimony that he was doing it wrong before. Okay? You know, it's like what a lot of preachers are trying to do. I swear some of these preachers that are, I know of out there are... It's like they're updating their doctrine when it comes to... I talked to one preacher when it comes to what he's teaching on Israel. I swear he's trying to transition into what we believe. And it's like... And he's still way off. And it's like, man, why don't you just get all in? You know, why don't you just... I mean, why don't you just completely change and just get it right? But it's like, uh, you know, if, I, if my change is too drastic then I'm going to have to explain what I've been doing for the last 30 years is wrong. I can't do that. Not with all the support I've collected. You know, not with all the money I've raised. I can't admit that I've been doing it wrong. And so it's like they do, they're trying to, you know, just, hey, just admit it. Get all in. 
Change. You know, admit that you are doing it wrong. And not only when you admit that you're doing it wrong, when a person openly changes, it says everyone else doing the same thing is wrong. And that's why you get in trouble. Well, why, why are you changing that? Well, I, I was wrong. But that's what I'm doing. And that happens in churches too. When somebody gets right with God in the church, maybe they change something in their life. You know, maybe one of the ladies starts, you know, dressing more modest and everybody knows, hey, why aren't you dressing the way you used to dress anymore? Because I shouldn't have been dressing that way. But I dress that way. Are you saying I shouldn't? And now all of a sudden we've got a problem. You know, now all of a sudden we got a problem on our hands. And it does. When you change, you're basically saying, hey, I was wrong. And therefore, you are still wrong. And people don't like that. People don't like it when you reveal to them that they are that they are backslidden. You know, some can't admit that they've been deceived. Look at Jeremiah chapter eight verse five. It says, "Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. Y'all see that they got tricked and they're hanging on to it." Why, why would you do that? Why would you hang on to deceit? Why would you allow some you know, crazy evangelist to come in and preach some goofiness and just, you know, listen, I've bought into some crazy stuff before. I did. I listened to the whole Brian Sharp Revelation series two times when I was younger. I listened to the whole thing and I, I taught all that stuff. I, I taught, there was all kinds of weird things that he got into. I bought into all of that stuff and I taught it when I taught teen class, I pretty much, my Revelation study was listening to his sermons on Revelation. That's terrible. All right? I'll admit it. I'm embarrassed by it now. I preached some of that stuff here. When we first started, we did some Wednesday nights, and I went to the book of Revelation, and I did a lot of, I taught a lot of that stuff. And I didn't come up with that stuff. I got it from somebody else. I got deceived. Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I hope you all forgive me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't do that anymore. I, I do my homework first. If I hear something that sounds really cool from a preacher, I check it up first. I've, I do my due diligence. I've got my ways of checking things out because I felt really stupid after I got my head screwed on straight. And, but a lot of people, they, they can't do that. I'm going to hold on to that deceit. No, don't, don't do that. Just admit it. This, and this is why many church members are scared of revival. See, when others get right, it puts pressure on you to get right too, doesn't it? You know, why do we care so much about what other churches do? When other churches get things right, why do people get all bent out of shape? Think, think about that for a second. What, who, who cares? Why do people care so much about what I'm teaching here? Because they know they probably should change too. And they must think their crowd isn't as forgiving as all of you are. And they, they, can't, they can't handle that. And it does. It brings, it brings the pressure. And that, that happens in church when people start getting right. A lot of times contention starts because it, does, it puts pressure on other people. And they don't want to admit they're backslidden. They've got too much pride. And even if you get, convince them they're wrong, they're too stubborn to change anything. And so if you're not going to change, nobody else is going to change either. If I'm going to be deceived, you've all got to be deceived too. You know, we've all got, we're all going to do the same thing. That way I don't have to feel alone in my misery. That's not, that's not the way it's supposed to work. But those who refuse to change, they just don't realize they've already changed through backsliding. I've never moved. I've been preaching 45, 50 years, and I've not moved a muscle. Yep, you've been standing there perfectly still on an icy hill, and you've been, but you don't realize you've been going backwards. And you are nowhere even near where you were at one time. You've not moved forward. You know, and it's like, yeah, I haven't changed in 35 years. So you haven't got, gotten closer to God in 35 years, and either have you. You haven't moved forward. I mean, do you really think that God is satisfied with where you're at right now? Do we think that as a church? Do we think God is satisfied with where we're at right now? 
I think we need to keep moving forward. I think we need to keep improving and getting better. Start, and so that's the third thing. Start moving forward. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many be perfect, be thus minded. If anything, be otherwise minded. God shall reveal even this unto you. I love what he said. You know, he's, Paul said, I'm going forward. I'm forgetting about those things that are behind me. Paul, when he went around preaching at camp meetings, he didn't do like the preachers of the camp meetings day and let me tell you all about the glory days of the 1970s. You know, back in the 1970s, we did this and we did that. And, you know, there was revivals and this and... and Always looking back. Always looking back on the glory days. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind me. He was always moving forward. And you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with the group opposite of Paul always looking backwards. I want to look forward. I want to press toward the mark for the pride of the high calling of God. Are they saying, so are you saying in the 1970s you hit the mark? In the 1970s, you did. You reached the prize of the high calling of God. Why didn't you stay there? You know, the truth is, we're not going to get there until Jesus Christ comes back. That tells me, if all you're doing is talking about the glory days of the 70s, you stopped somewhere and you started going backwards. You've backslidden. And then they do. And then they can't stand groups that are out there that are saying, you know what? I'm going to forget the glory days of the 70s and I'm going to move forward. I'm going to go on for God. I'm not going to stay back with the backsliders. I'm going to move forward. And they don't like that. It makes them uncomfortable. And you know, we, we, But we've got to do that. We've got to start moving forward. Let us, the, us therefore as many be perfect or complete, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. What are we supposed to do? What's next? What's God going to change in our life? Well, listen, we've got to do the first things first. Move forward. Take that step forward. And you know what? God's going to show us something else. If we stay right with God, if we start moving forward, and this is scary for me as a preacher, we're going to find out more things that we're not doing perfect. I might find out, hey, y'all, y'all remember that sermon I preached a while back about this? Um, can you all please forget that one? I, I, I've, I've got to re-preach this because I, you know what? I learned something. I found, I found out more. Hey, I, I've gotten better. Hey, you know how we used to do this? In church, we shouldn't do that anymore. We're gonna we're gonna stop doing that. Let's let's leave that behind. Let's forget about that. I know that's what we've always done. I know we used to always do it, but let's let's go forward. Let's get closer to God. Let's let's do better. And what's it gonna be? You know, we're scared of change. Well, what's God gonna do? What am I gonna have to get rid of? I don't know. But if we whatever it is, we'll be glad when we do. You'll be thrilled when you do it. And if you are, if you're focused on the glory days, you're backslidden. Luke 9, verse 62 says, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I've never plowed. They say when you plow, you do. You got to get your focus on an object way out in front of you, and you just got to stay focused on that. You don't look back, you don't look to the side. And you've got all these guys, they're trying to pattern their churches off of. Glory days of the 70s, you know. And listen, it, it was a different time back then. I say this all the time, you know, there was a time you could get a building, put a steeple on it, put a sign out in front of it that says church, and you were going to fill it up. But we're not living in that day today. This world's getting more evil, partly because we've backslidden. You know, we, you know there was a time you could, you could fill a church up without even soul winning. Now... You know, and so they did. They, they, they should have been soul winning even if the churches were full. But they didn't. They got backslidden. And now it's hard. You know, we, we've practically lost a generation. Now listen, if, if you're just like everyone else, you're backslidden. And that's what everybody wants to do. You know, we're just, let's, let's be like everyone else. Let's do what everybody else is doing. Let's pat ourselves after this church. We're supposed to be looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If you're looking at everybody else, you're probably already backslidden. If you haven't changed in 30 or 40 years, you're probably backslidden. You know, if you're, you know, as a preacher, if you're recycling the same old sermons, 
over and over again, when we have an inexhaustible book, you're probably backslidden. You know, I'm, I'm amazed at these traveling evangelists that they preach like 10 sermons a year. Over and over and over again. Really, you're reading this book and that's all you've got? What's wrong? Something. I think you're backslidden. I think you're, I think you're backslidden. If you're, if you're not regularly under conviction, you're backslidden. Hebrews 2.1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now see that? We don't throw these things away. We don't just... So we're not, this isn't re- like rebellion. This is, backsliding is different. It's some, there's some things that we let slip. There's some things we let go away. A lot of these churches that aren't soul winning, they didn't just get up one day and say, you know what? Soul winning stupid. It doesn't do any good. We're done. They, they didn't do that. It slipped. It happened slowly. They, bat, they, you know, they, they, they just got away from it. And now it's maybe been years since they've done it. And Oh man, what's going on? You know, I, I knew a guy one time, he was all, you know, whenever you talk about soul winning, he would always jump in the conversation and tell his soul winning stories. And all of them for when he was in Bible college. And the guy hadn't been in Bible college in 20 years. And it's just like, all right, congratulations. You, you went soul winning 20 years ago. You know, do something now, you know. And, you, you know, you hear these preachers all the time. They're, they're, all their stories they tell, and, say, and I've heard some of these guys tell these stories several times. They, these evangelists, they preach the same things over and over again. And I've heard these stories 10 times, and they're from like 20 years ago. It's like, have you not done anything in the last year? Oh, and by the way, first time I heard you tell that story, it wasn't that good. You know, it, it, it gets a little better every time. Yeah, it was only four people that you won the first time I heard that. You know, now it's four hundred. You know, what's what's going on here? And, you, and it's it's sad, but that's backsliding. But they do they they slip if we're not careful. We've got to be on guard. And backsliding, it's not like many other sins. It happens all by itself. It takes zero effort on our part. It can sometimes it can be many years before we realize what we've done. But the, the important thing to remember is when you find yourself in a backslidden state, you don't have to stay there. If you can overcome pride and stubbornness, okay, and, and those can be tough. If you can overcome pride and stubbornness, you can get back to where you were before. You don't have to be one of those Christians to go around talking about the glory days. You can be living them today. That's what I want. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about the glory. I want to I want to experience those days today. I want my kids to see God do something great. I want you all to see it. I I want it to be I I, I want to think our best days are ahead. Not oh, remember remember this. And you know what? I can honestly say that most of the time when we talk about the last 6 years when when we when we go back we're we're man so much better now. You know, we're always like, yeah, remember when it was like this? Oh, I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's, it's so much better now. That, that, that's what we're saying all the time. And you know what? I hope one of these days, like, yeah, I remember back in 2017 how it was then. You know, man, I'm glad it's not that way now. It's so much better now. And so far, that's how it's been. But I don't want to get satisfied with where we're at right now. If we do, we will start backsliding. Let's keep moving forward. Let's keep on going forward for Christ. So with that, let's all stand together.